you ever think much about angels? Uh, you know, angels are kind of popular in our culture. Uh, you look around, and, and there's a lot of books about angels. They come up in movies and TV shows. Uh, you see all kinds of artwork, even jewelry. Um, this week I was at Barnes and Noble and, and, and just kind of noticing some of the, the books that they have there on angels. And, and, and there's one category, there's like fiction books where it's, you know, it's, it's kind of there in the, next to the vampire books, you've got the angel books. Um, they have a whole section in Barnes and Noble now. It's, it's so specific. It's teen paranormal romance, right? So that's vampires, angels, all that stuff thrown in that category. So there's stuff like that. But then you go over to the spirituality aisle, and um, you find all kinds of books about angels, and they talk about communicating with angels and getting direction from them, getting help for your life and, and healing even. Uh, and so, you know, last week we saw, we were, talked a little bit about Islam and about Mormonism and saw that angels played a, a foundational role there. Both of the, the founders uh, of those religions had received revelations from angels. And of course, in the Bible, we see a lot about angels too. So there's this, there's this overall fascination with, with angels that we see in, in our culture, in our world. Uh, but what I want to suggest this morning is that the study of angels can be a dangerous thing. It can be kind of this all-consuming subject. People can become obsessed with angels. And I think part of it is, is what we've been talking about in this series, that people want to have some kind of spiritual encounter. And when even, even Christians will look at, that and look at the subject of angels and see, well, that might be a way for me to have that experience, that encounter with the supernatural. Uh, but the problem is that when we seek after that experience, angels can begin to become more important to us than Jesus. Right? That's what happens when you pursue things like that. The importance of Jesus gets less and less in your life. Some people pray to angels. Some people at different times and places have even worshipped angels. And so today we're looking at the, the book of Hebrews. We just started into it last week. And here in Hebrews chapter 1 uh, verses 4 through 14, what the author does, he presents four reasons to regard Jesus as more important than angels. Now, it's never specifically mentioned in, in the book that it's written to the Hebrews, but some of the old uh, ancient manuscripts have that title on it to the Hebrews, and it makes sense as we go through the book that these were, these were people who had been Jews, and they had become Christians. They believed the Old Testament, and, and after Christ came, they, they accepted Him as the promised Messiah. They began to follow Him. But as we go through the book of Hebrews, what we see is that some of the, that they were kind of slipping back into some of the, the Old Testament beliefs. They were, they were, Jesus was somehow becoming less important to them in different ways. And we'll talk about that as we go through the book. But one of those has to, to be this point about angels. They seem to have been, had this growing obsession with angels. And so what the author does in this passage is he gives us these four reasons or these four points of comparison. He, it's, it's great because what he does is he teaches us about angels, about a biblical view of angels. We'll get that today. We'll, we'll see that. But at the same time, he even teaches us more in the process about Jesus, to see who Jesus is and understand him. So why is this, why, why is this a worthwhile topic for us today? Well, you know, my first thought is this. There are a lot of false views of angels floating around out there. And I, I kind of mentioned some different things there earlier. Uh, some of those views give angels too much power. They exalt angels way too much. But the other side of it is some of us really don't think of angels at all. We kind of have, have bought into the, the materialistic, uh, scientific mindset that, that looks at life of, as just the things that we can observe and touch and experiment with. And because angels don't fit into that category, we don't, we don't even believe in angels. 
So today we need to find that, that balance point, to see, to have an accurate biblical understanding of angelic beings, um, not too high and not too low. We need uh, discernment. And what I want to suggest to you secondly is that as we do that, as we grow to understand about angels and about Jesus in the process, like I said, as we go through this passage, we'll see that our understanding of Jesus just deepens and our appreciation for him grows and that this knowledge about angels actually compels us to worship Christ more. So with that in mind, take a Bible and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. And we'll look at, begin in verse 4. The first reason that the author gives us to show us that Jesus is more important than angels is because of their identity. Right? In our culture, we give names sort of randomly. I mean, your parents gave you a name, and, and maybe it was just a name that they liked. Maybe it does have some family significance, but most cases, probably not. It was just a popular name at the time. They liked how it sounded, thought it was cute or whatever. And uh, so they gave you that name. But when we read in the Bible, names take on an entirely different significance. Uh, names in the Bible are, are descriptive and even sometimes prophetic. They show a person's character and, and purpose in life. And so part of the argument here in verses 4 and 5, as, as we begin this section here in Hebrews, is focusing on the difference uh, in the name between angels and, and Jesus. And so to get the feel of where we're going here, we'll start reading in verse 3. It says there about Jesus, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And then verse 4 says, Having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Well, what is he talking about? What is the name of, of angels? Well, that, that word angel is just a, a transliteration of the Greek term. The Greek term is angelos. And that simply means messenger. Our translations probably should just say messenger and not use the word angel. Because there's all sorts of things that go along with that word angel. And similarly, when we look at the Old Testament, the word that's used is this word malak. And so that's where, you know, the book Malachi at the end of the Old Testament, last book of the Old Testament, that's an instance where that term messenger is used of a human being, not an angelic being. Malachi was a prophet, right? And so his name, Malachi, means my messenger. He's a messenger of God. So sometimes that title messenger is used of, of humans. But most of the time in the Bible, as you read through, you find it used of spiritual beings, what we normally call angels, who appear most of the time in human form. At times, people, they're not uh, distinguishable. There's nothing that shows that they're, in, that they're angels. They look like normal people. And they serve two purposes. One, uh, they, they communicate for God in, 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 in a lot of cases, most of the time. And on some occasions, they also carry out God's judgment. Now, a few of those angelic beings are are identified by name, such as the angel Gabriel. Remember Gabriel? We talk about it at Christmas time, how Gabriel appeared to Mary as she was to announce her pregnancy, to tell her that she was pregnant with Jesus. Right? That, that's where we see that, that communicating role that angels fulfill. Or another angel mentioned in the scripture is the angel Michael. Uh, he's mentioned both in, in the book of Daniel, in the Old Testament, and in the in Jude, in the New Testament, as, as an archangel, a chief angel who fights against Satan. So we get some sense of, of the role, the general role of angels, kind of introduce them there. But it, in that verse, in verse 4 that we read there, it talked about the name of Jesus. What is, what is he getting at? What name? Well, look at verse 5. 
Here's what it says. It says, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So when the author of Hebrews talks about the name, he's talking about the name Son of God, referring to Jesus that way. And it gets at the same point that we saw last week when we talked about prophets, right? We said there was a, a, a difference between a prophet who is a human messenger and, and Jesus as God's son. Well, this is the same, making the same point. Right? There's a difference between even an angelic messenger and the Son of God. Now, last week, as we looked at that term Son, back up in verse uh, 2, we talked about uh, how it shows Jesus' equality with God the Father. How there's a, a unity and equality, a unique relationship. And in fact, in, in John chapter 5, if you, if you read that portion of the Gospels, uh, the Jews wanted to stone Jesus because when he called himself the Son of God, they said he was equating himself with God. Right? That's the significance of that term. But here it seems to be used in a different way. Because look at verse 4. Again, here it says that he has an inherited, that the, the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Verse 5, that, that quotation there says, you are my son today, I have begotten you. And at the end of the verse, it says, I will be a father to him, and he shall be to me a son. So here we're talking about sonship in a, in a different sense. There's a sense in which he's a son eternally, in the way that he relates to God the Father, but, but here it's in a different sense. And to try to see what, what the author of Hebrews is getting at, we have to look at these, these verses that he quotes. He quotes two passages from the Old Testament. Uh, the first one is from Psalm 2, and the second one's from 2 Samuel 7. And I want to start with that one from 2 Samuel chapter 7. Uh, that chapter in the Bible is what we call the Davidic covenant. God comes to, to King David and, and speaks to him through the prophet Nathan and, and makes a promise to David. And here's what that promise said. Let me, let me show you this verse. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12. The prophet says to David, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. So David's going to have a, a dynasty, a succession of kings. Uh, but then the prophet continues. He says, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So there's that title, son, that, that the author of Hebrews is talking about. So that prophecy, those words there in 2 Samuel 7, in a very immediate sense, they were directed at David's immediate successor, his son Solomon. Because Solomon was the one who, who built a house in the sense that he built a, a temple for the worship of God. But ultimately, I mean, Solomon didn't live forever. Right? And this verse is talking about someone who's going to be reigning over an eternal kingdom, a kingdom with no end. And so it's bigger than Solomon. It's ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. So when it says when the author of Hebrews quotes this verse, he's looking at Jesus' sonship, not in a sense of, of his eternal relationship with God, but in a sense of Jesus fulfilling this promise to David. Right? It's something that only a human being can do. And that's the amazing thing about Jesus, that he, being God, being the eternal Son of God, became man so that he could fulfill these promises. Now let's look for a moment at, Psalm, at the quote from Psalm 2. Here's Psalm 2, verse 7. And this is the one that, that Hebrews quotes. It says, I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And then, but then it continues. Look at the next verse. It helps us understand the point of this. 
ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. See, so it's continuing to talk about that idea of, of the kingdom, of this kingdom responsibility. So, so here's where this is going in Hebrews. This is why he quotes those things. From a superficial perspective, you could look at Jesus and say, well, he's just a man. He's a human being. And angels are spiritual beings, so they must be greater than him. But the point he's making is that every prophecy in the Old Testament points ultimately to Jesus. All of these expectations, all the hope and the anticipation in the Old Testament looks forward to Jesus. So his messianic identity as the Son of God makes him greater than the angels. They're just messengers who come to, to point forward to him. But he's the one who fulfills it as the son of God. So there's this sense of this difference between them. He is greater because of his identity, as we said. Now, let's move on to a second reason. Uh, the second reason the author of Hebrews gives us is because of he compares their position different position between Jesus and the angels. You know what happens just 94 days from today? <laughs> yes, it's a Christmas morning. Uh, 94 days to shop. And it's that time in our culture when we exchange gifts, right? And, and exchanging gifts for us, it's, I mean, it's something we do that's fun, but but it really is, you know, we give gifts back and forth, and it's not really that, that big of a deal in a sense. But in other cultures, they looked at gift giving differently. I mean, in some cultures, uh, some people give and some people receive. It's a matter of status or rank or position. And Hebrews makes that kind of distinction between Jesus and angels. In verse 6, Hebrews 1, verse 6, take a look at it. It says, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Now, one of the challenges in looking at this verse is that quotation, those exact words, don't appear anywhere in our Hebrew manuscripts of the Old Testament. Um, Psalm 97 has a similar line. Here's what Psalm 97, verse 7 says. It says, All worshipers of images are put to shame, who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. Now what we find is that the Greek translation of the Old Testament, because the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, the Greek translation of that, instead of using the word gods, uses the word angels. There's also a similar uh, uh, line in the Greek translation of a, of a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 32. And so what's going on here is this verse is talking, uh, is speaking out against the worship of idols, right? That was the second commandment, remember? The uh, second commandment that God gave to Moses and the Israelites was that they shouldn't make any graven image or some statue to worship that that provoked God to, to jealousy because it wasn't true to who he is. And so here, the response to that in that psalm was saying uh, that it was calling angels, or, or in the original Hebrew, gods, in that sense, use the term that way to refer to them, to worship him. So the, the, the point we're getting at here, going back to Hebrews, is that angels give worship Jesus receives worship. And isn't that, isn't that what we remember when we, when we celebrate Christmas? In Luke's gospel, remember the, the angels, and they appear to the shepherds, right? On that, that first Christmas night. And then what do they do? They praise God for the birth of Jesus. In fact, if we jump ahead to the end of the New Testament, to Revelation chapter 5, we talked about that chapter last week a little bit. In Revelation 5, it talks about uh, what it calls four living creatures. These are also angelic beings. It just refers to them in, in a different way. 
And these creatures are described in a very strange way. They're also seen by the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Ezekiel. It says that they have six wings, right? Not just one pair of wings, like a lot of our representations of angels, but six wings. And that they're full of eyes. And they have different faces, like a, a lion, a man, an ox, and an eagle. Isaiah uses the term seraphim for them, which means shining ones. And their purpose is not to communicate or, or to carry out judgment like we saw with, as we talked about uh, angels in a broader sense, but these angelic beings, their purpose, it seems, is to guard the glory of God. And so they're always, whenever they, they're found in the scripture, they're always surrounding the presence of God. And they cry out, holy, holy, holy. That's, that's always their focus. But when you read Revelation chapter 5, those incredible, strange beings that, that are around the presence of God and his glory, in Revelation 5 it says that they bow down to Jesus. They worship him. See, he has an entirely different position with them. Angels give worship, Jesus receives worship. And so we have to see that. Jesus is worthy of worship. And here in, in, in Hebrews, in that verse we looked at, Hebrews 1, verse 6, it calls him the firstborn. The firstborn. Now, uh, that, that term is used several times throughout the New Testament. In, in, in two of the cases, Colossians 1.18 and Revelation 1.5, it calls him the firstborn from the dead. And, and so the idea is this. It's that he was the first human being to, to rise from the dead, to receive a glorified resurrection body. He's the one who makes the glory of resurrected life possible for the rest of creation. So another passage calls him the firstborn of all creation. That's who he is. Now in ancient culture, they use that term firstborn to talk about the, the, the oldest child who would receive the family inheritance and the honor that goes along with it. And so when we think of Jesus, because he is the firstborn, he is worthy of worship. Now, one of the implications of this, and it kind of should be, it should be obvious to us here, but if, if that is their positions, their status or rank, that angels give worship and Jesus receives worship, then we should see that angels should not be worshipped, right? Doesn't that make sense? And sometimes in the Bible, people have done that, have worshipped angels accidentally. Like in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, the Apostle John says, he's having this incredible revelation, this angel appears to him, and he says, then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. So an angel corrects him, right? The angel knows that that's not his purpose. He's not there to receive worship. That's inappropriate. And so he tells John, you know, stop it. Don't do that. Now, like I say, sometimes people worship angels accidentally, but sometimes it's intentional. In the book of Colossians, as Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, he deals with people who are actually trying to get believers to worship angels. And it's, it's here, Colossians 2, uh, verse 18, it says, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism, that's uh, depriving your body, you know, treating yourself harshly, and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. And, and look at what it says in the next verse. Here's what happens when you do that. When you give in to that kind of mysticism that described in that, in verse 18, it leads to this. Not holding fast to the head. That's a way of talking about Jesus, isn't it? From whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. So you cannot worship angels 
and still hold fast to Jesus as the head of the church. Now, when we come to Hebrews here, I don't think these Hebrews were necessarily worshiping angels. Uh, they were, if, if they were he Hebrews, if they had a Jewish background, they wouldn't do that. But I think it's possible that they were kind of obsessed with angels. They were just overly focused on angels. And because of that, Jesus was becoming less and less important to them. Now, a modern day parallel uh, might be that some people today, like I said, pray to angels. That's a practice sometimes uh, seen even in the Roman Catholic Church. And the idea behind it is to seek extra help in, in interceding with God. The, the basic thought is that I need all the help that I can get to get God to do what I want, so rather than just praying to Him on my own, I'm going to try to get support and help from others, from angels and, and saints. Now, people would say, uh, people who do that would say that it, they would insist that that's not worship. And, and in a sense, technically, I guess that's true, but I, I don't see how you separate praying to, to, to some being and, and worshiping that being. You see, what we get at is this passage from 1 Timothy chapter 2. Paul says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So if you start looking to angels at an, as an additional mediator, it kind of says that Jesus is not enough, that, that he isn't sufficient, uh, that he, he isn't really who he said he is, that he's not, he's not the one true mediator. That truth about him gets lost. So that's, we, we have to see this, this positional difference between angels and Jesus. Angels give worship in that sense, they're just like us. That's what they're designed and created to do. But Jesus receives worship. And that leads to another reason that Jesus is greater than angels. And it's, it's the third reason is nature. Nature. Uh, one of the most powerful pictures of God in, in the Bible, I think, is, is when God's spoken of as a potter. Right? Watch, watch any, any potter, any, anyone who's, who's working with clay. And one, whether they're good or not at, at what they're doing, and one thing becomes very, very clear, right? There is a difference between the potter and the pot. Right? One is the, is, is the one creating, and one is the object, is the thing that is created. And that same difference is what separates Jesus and angels, they have a fundamentally different nature, a fundamentally different being. So angels are created beings. And this comes out in Hebrews 1, verse 7. It says there, of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Now that's a quotation from Psalm 104. And scholars kind of debate what the significance is of those words wind and, and fire. Some think it, it describes the, the nature, the immaterial nature of, of angels, that, that they're like wind, they're like fire, they're not, they're not tangible that you can touch and feel. Uh, some think that, that those words are just illustrations, pictures of, of their speed or their destructive power. But I think the main point here when we compare this verse with what comes after it is, is that just the way the verse begins. He makes his angels. They are created. They're not eternal. And so corresponding to that, we have to say that Jesus, on the other hand, is the eternal creator. Look at verse 8. It says, but of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. 
Verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Now, that's a quote from Psalm 45. And Psalm 45, interestingly, is sort of phrased as a wedding song. And it's, it's very strange that Israelites, Israelites would really never call their king God. But that's kind of the way the psalm reads, right? There in verse 9, God, your God, has anointed you. It's an interesting statement there. And Hebrews here clearly applies it to Jesus, right? It says that this verse is talking, these verses are talking about him. So it's his throne that is forever and ever. It's eternal. He's the one who's perfectly righteous. He's the one who's, like it says, anointed with gladness. He's the eternal king. And then the author quotes from another psalm, from Psalm 102. Look at what he says in verse 10. He says, And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. You see that point that he's driving at? In both of those quotations, the author of Hebrews is trying to show us that Jesus is eternal. He has no beginning, and he has no end. That he made all of, he was involved in creating all that exists, creating the universe. And like it says there, verse 11, they will perish, but he remains. And he outlasts this current uh, heaven and earth. The Bible talks about a time when God will make a new heaven and earth, right? But Jesus is, is eternal. He, he is beyond creation. And so what we're getting at again is that he's infinitely more important than angelic beings. So one more reason that the author gives us, reason for their activity. The fourth reason to see Jesus is more important than angels, their activity. Now this may be, the, the, this argument may speak most strongly to our culture. Because you know, different cultures define your value in different ways. Uh, some cultures define your value by your relationships, your family, right? Some cultures by your rank in society. Some cultures define your value by your character. Uh, but our culture tends to define people's value, whether it's good or bad, we still do it, by what you do, right? I mean, isn't that one of the first questions when you talk to somebody that, that comes up? Well, what do you do? What's your job? What box can I put you in? <laughs> like I say, not always a good thing that we think that way, but, but it's, it's kind of how it is. And yet, that's what the, the point that the author of Hebrews makes here. He shows us that there's a difference between Jesus and angels by what they do. Look at verse 13. It says, To which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And then verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. So the point is this. Angels serve believers. That's their activity. But Jesus sits in heaven. Right? This is a quotation from Psalm 110, uh, verse 1. We read it last week. And, and it's right where we began, back up at the beginning of the chapter, right? Look back up to verse 3 for a moment. Remember, it said that he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And here he gets to the end of the chapter and he, he reinforces that same point. What is Jesus doing right now? He's sitting in heaven. Theologians call it his session. And the idea is this. He accomplished his work of salvation. And he's seated in heaven now, waiting for the time when he will return to rule. There's no loftier activity than this. And it's a graphic picture because it says he's waiting for the time when 
his enemies are made into a footstool for his feet. The picture of that is, is like in ancient times that a king would, would put his foot on his enemy's neck. Right? It's this picture of, of complete and total victory. And Jesus is, is just waiting for that to occur when that will happen here on earth. That's his activity. But in contrast, verse 14, the angels are not sitting, are they? No, the angels are, are busy. It says that they're doing things for who? For the sake of those who will inherit salvation. In other words, they're serving us. They're serving believers. What does that mean? How does that happen? What are they doing? There's two passages that, that may help us here to understand this a little bit, to unpack this idea. The first one's from Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12. It says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now, let's hold on to that thought for a minute. Let's move on to another passage, similar thought. Matthew 18, verse 10. Jesus said this. He said, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. He's talking about believers there. Why? He says, for I tell you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. You know, these verses suggest to us that there may truly be something as, such as guardian angels who watch out for us. Now, we're never told exactly how they do this, and there's never any suggestion in, in Scripture that we should seek to communicate with them, as some people try to do. The idea is that they are servants of God. They carry out His will, right? That's what the, the passage says. They're watching His face. If God is in the least bit concerned, they go to carry out His will. And so who do we speak to? We don't speak to angels. We speak to God. Right, that's when we pray. And there's not even any indication from what we read about uh, this idea here about angels serving us. There's no indication that we'll even know that it's happened. But we get this sense. That's one of the things that separates Jesus from angels. They're off busy scurrying around the universe, however that works, to serve Believers, those who will inherit salvation. But Jesus is sitting at, the, at his Father's right hand, right, in the position of power and honor and authority. So, you know, we've, we've phrased this, ser this whole series, these first few chapters of Hebrews, as good news for mystic seekers. And as we talk about angels today, the good news for mystic seekers is, first of all, that angels are real. There truly are angelic beings who are messengers from God. They are active among us. They're powerful spiritual beings. But at the same time, we have to see that they are creatures created by God just as we are. And far beyond angels in, in significance and power and worth is Jesus. As the Son of God, He is the eternal creator who became man to redeem us and to reign as king in a perfect future kingdom. So I would say this. Don't pursue angels in and of themselves, but follow their example. Follow their example in worshiping and serving the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So as we think of how to respond to this passage. It's, it's been a challenging passage. Hopefully you've kept up with me through this. There's a lot, of, a lot of content today. But maybe on a practical level this week, a good response would be to, to read through Hebrews 1 and 2 because there's more about angels in Hebrews 2 also and, and comparing them with Jesus. Maybe this, some of this, what we've talked about today is all new and, and, and strange. So soak some of this in more. Or maybe a good response today for you 
would be to begin to worship Jesus as God. Maybe you've never come to that point in your life. And we've seen today, if angels worship him, if these incredible spiritual beings are focused on worshiping Christ, then shouldn't we have that same focus? If you are not devoted to Christ and following him, then I would encourage you to take that step today to, to begin on that path of following him. A another thought here, just in the same way that, that focusing too much on angels can minimize the importance of Christ in someone's life, you know, there's all sorts of other things that could do the same thing. You could get caught up in focusing on any number of things, even good things, that end up some way making the worship of Christ less important in your life, right? I've seen people do that with a focus on prophecy, right? Or people who, who love doctrine or, or people who, you know, are, are really concerned about justice. There's all sorts of things that in and of themselves seem good, but if they become more important than worshiping Christ, then they're getting in the way. Because this is what we're called to, to worship Him. So maybe, maybe there's something you need to put aside. Something in your life that's, that's, that's minimizing Christ. Or maybe, maybe you know somebody who's just excited about angels, right? Maybe you have a friend who, who wears angel pins or an angel uh, necklace or something like that, or who talks about angels. And maybe this would be a great passage to share with them. To say, look at Jesus, because he's better than angels. 